reasons for LeBron's disappearing act and disappointing Game 3 stat line have been dissected for two days now. Asked earlier today about bouncing back, LeBron was all about the bottom line. LeBron, what's the key score for nice game? Win. <laughs> What's good? Welcome to the best 60 minutes of your day. Bad day at the office for the baddest ball player on the planet in game three, but he's never scored 15 or fewer points in back-to-back -back playoff games. In fact, Westgate has the over-under on LeBron points for game four at 31 and a half. Wow. You taking an over on that, <laughs> Brian Winhorst? I am taking the over. I mean, he's averaging more than that in the postseason. It uh, wouldn't surprise me at all if he has a big game tonight. What I think you're going to see is more quickness, more pace, more activity from LeBron. He had a very low energy game three. Um, the Cavs as a team only had two fast break points. I think the Celtics specifically had a strategy to put them on the line and slow the game down. They had three times as many free throws as the Celtics, but you didn't hear Boston complaining about the officiating, at least not too much. So I think that was part of their game plan to slow LeBron down. It worked. He was out of rhythm. I expect him to try to get back into that rhythm by moving faster. Seems simple, but it would be a big deal. Yeah, yeah it is. But low energy. Why, when after game one and two, LeBron seemed to try to uh, talk about a sense of urgency? We can get better. We still have another level. And for him to have a low energy game three, that's surprising. What was the reason for that? Well, I think the, you know, they, they came out and they played great. They had a huge first half, had a huge lead, and LeBron kind of maybe thought he could get away with the night off. I mean, they were midway through the third quarter, up 21, and he had 11 points. Maybe he didn't feel like he needed to be engaged in that game. Hmm. And when it came time to need him, he wasn't able to change his mindset. So we'll see. I bet that he won't, he won't let his teammates set the tone tonight. I bet he comes out and looks to do it himself. Okay. All right. We appreciate you joining us, Brian. And to further sort of bring home what an aberration that was in the first 10 games this postseason, LeBron averaged 34 points on 57% shooting from the field. But in game three, he scored just 11 points on four of 13 shooting, turned the ball over six times in 45 minutes on the court. So this is the way I look at this. This is a little bit of role reversal here. The Celtics will not win another game. Yes, the person who said they'd win two games in this series. Of course, I said that when they had Isaiah Thomas. They won't win another game. I fully expect LeBron James to go scorched earth tonight. Uh, uh, certainly LeBron James is a, a good LeBron James, but a bad LeBron James, I think, for the other team. Not that he has time to have gathered himself and to understand what should have happened and how they should have closed this team out. I don't think the Cavs have any interest, or not close them out, but further put their foot on their neck. I don't think the Cavs have any interest of backing into a dogfight. LeBron's the least of my concerns tonight and should be the least of the Cavs' concerns. Uh, I don't think he's going to come out and be aggressive in terms of looking for his shot for the sake of proving a point or quieting the naysayers or anything like that. I think he's going to still make the right basketball play. I guess my issue would be not how many points LeBron puts up, but how many points he's able to create. And that takes two. Like, are you still going to get the same production that you got from Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love that went to waste in game three, in game four? Look, I'm not going to sit up here and completely reverse how I see this series going. But like I told you yesterday, if you blink, this, this could be a long series. How, Sway? I, I just, I don't see that. This is a trust factor. And... As much as the Cavs blowing such a, uh, a large lead, blowing a 20-point-plus 20, uh, 20 lead in Game 3 is disconcerting. And, yes, it's reminiscent of some bad habits they had post-All-Star break and late in the season, and I get that. We both pointed that out. But between these two entities, what do you trust more? We know we both trust LeBron. That's not the point. I trust who the Cavs, that the Cavs team that we saw in Games 1 and 2, that's the Cavs team that is really there. It's hard for me to trust Whatever lineup uh, this Boston Celtics team winds up presenting with Amir Johnson still being banged up with the shoulder and being a kind of a game time decision, if you will. I, I, are you going to trust Marcus Smart to score 27 again? No, it's not about trust. I'm not even picking the Celtics to win this game. What I'm saying is they're not going to just fold up shop. We no. know this about them. And they seem to be a different team. Not a better team without Isaiah Thomas, but a different team and perhaps a more problematic matchup for the Cavaliers when it comes to improved ball movement and defense without Isaiah Thomas. So, look, it could be 3-1 after tonight, but you're telling me you don't think the Celtics could, make, could push it to six by winning game five at home in front of that crowd? No, I don't. And, if, and once they get to six, just when you saw how they just won game three, 
Maybe they push it to seven. I'm just saying this is an interesting Celtics team. I'm not predicting they're going to win this series or they're going to win this game. I could see it happen, though. I, I can see it. I guess I'm just not sold whether or not that was just an interesting game or has this officially become an interesting series. I'm more leaning on the side of that was just an interesting Lightning. game. It was just luck. It so was, you on a, you, it's no, basically you sound like it was I would, just, I wouldn't say they luck caught the, the Cavs slipping. That's disrespectful to the Celtics, but I think it's a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. Boston took advantage of an opportunity the Cavs were not as sharp in the second half of that game as they needed See, to be. I just be. thought that was more about the Celtics than, than the Cavs. For me. I don't know about that. Um, moving on to the other series, uh, which is now over. Kevin Durant sure made it look easy last night against the Spurs. 29 points on 13 shots, shooting 76.9% from the field. His best field goal percentage in any of his 101 mm. playoff games, I know. Durant is back in the finals for the first time since 2012 when he was a member of the Oklahoma City Thunder and lost to LeBron James and the Heatles. Uh, yesterday, Kevin Durant said that win or lose, he made the right decision to come to the Warriors. But does making it to the finals, does that already officially validate this decision to go to the Warriors? See, I don't, need, I don't think his decision needed validation. Um, and, A, he didn't go there just to get to the finals. He went there to win a championship or championships. I still maintain, I believe that this was not a – that the Thunder couldn't beat the Warriors. They just didn't beat the Warriors. They were good enough up 3-1 – to to take a 3-1 lead, Mm -hmm. so they were good enough, in my mind, to beat them had he stayed there. So I don't think he left because he couldn't get it done. I think he left because he wanted a change. He's personally happy. He's professionally happy. And it's not like they weren't going to do this. It's not like they were underdogs. This is where they were supposed to be. I'm not discrediting what they've accomplished. We'll get to that in a second. We'll get to that in a second. (laughs) But this is where they were supposed to be, and they were supposed to win this thing. So I don't think getting there necessarily validates the decision. It's what we all expected to happen once he went there. I think his decision was validated the moment that he signed. Um, right. Because this is what he wanted to do. He's a free agent. He, he made his decision. And, and, and for a lot of those reasons you said. I also think it was, frankly, a bold and a brave decision. And I know a lot of people look at the Warriors, the makeup of their team, and say, how can that be bold? How can that be brave to join a team that won 70-some games, set the regular season uh, record? Because a lot of guys, we see this all the time in the NBA, they're content with their situations. They're content not to change. And a lot of them are, frankly, content not to chase championships. Look, we spend a lot of time, not you and I individually or even together, but in this sporting society, a lot of time is spent berating players for not winning championships, okay? Well, when they try to actually win one, you can't say, well, they're taking the easy way out or, uh, you know, he, he did the weak move by going to a team that was already loaded. No, to me, it, it, it takes a lot to change from a very familiar circumstance uh, to go with what had already been somewhat successful and just decide, you know what, this is where I have a better basketball future. This is where I can have a longer championship window. This is where I can truly fulfill no. my goal as a player and win a no. ring. And I don't see anything wrong with that. No, you can respect his decision, but you don't have to break your arm and patting him on the back. It, it, just, it sounds like you're trying to give him credit. That's like, saying, that's like somebody saying something really stupid, which we're both familiar. <laughs> that's like somebody saying something Speak really stupid and be like, oh, well, you know, at least he's honest. Like, like look. No, no, he that's can, not the same thing. No, it is, he, can go, same he thing. can go to Golden State. You can respect his decision. And you can observe and recognize the fact that it was an unpopular this decision and that he's probably not going to get the he same put type more of— more pressure and scrutiny on himself by Golden State than there would have been with him at Oklahoma City. And I don't think there's any denying that. There's none. But Jamel, yes. he went to a team that they did three straight finals. He went to a team that went to two without him. Okay. He went to a team that he's not. He- Look, yes, he's taken somewhat of a backseat in terms of the amount of shots that he's right. going to take. He's got to be that much he more went efficient. To a team that wasn't there's some quote, sacrifice unquote, involved. And yes, there's some scrutiny he involved. He his ego to go. But to it's a team. easier. How? It's easy because you went to those. OK, this, this is, is why this is why okay, I say, we're not going to have. Okay, this is why I say it's not easier. All right. And, and this is degrees of ease. Yes. On paper, because of what he was joining, and I understand the talent level, right? I get that. Yeah. So I'm not dismissing that at all. But the the fact of the matter is, only a title will suffice. And even then, I understand and that. even then, a title in some people's eyes really might not be good enough. And you know why that is? Well, because everybody because he joined the Warriors. Because he joined the Warriors, and I understand there's an that. There's But nature there's to something this to be said for somebody putting a bigger sure. bullseye on their back to win a title, and I think he did that. Okay. Sure, it was the Blazers, the Jazz, and what was left of the Spurs, but for all the great teams throughout all the postseasons in all of NBA history, only the Warriors, despite everything we just said, 
can lay claim to starting the second season this well. The Warriors became the first team in NBA history to start the postseason 12-0, outscoring their opponents by more than 16 points per game and spending all of 107 minutes trailing. So say what you want about the competition. To be the first to start 12-0 is still saying something, despite what people say about how they came together. And after his team became the first to sweep three best-of-seven series in the same postseason, Warriors owner Joe Lacob said what we all knew to be the case, that this is about redemption. Quote, I don't care who we play, but my preference is Cleveland. We have some unfinished business. We, are the, we were the better team, but they did win. Oh, he had the ticket there. Huh? <laughs> we need a chance to go in there and prove that. I don't know that this could be unfinished business. It's different business. It's not unfinished business. It's different employees, namely <laughs> Kevin Durant. <laughs> right. Like, if you were the better team, you'd have just come back with the same team and tried to beat them again, a la the Spurs a couple of years ago. But you came back, you brought a bazooka to a gunfight. You came back with Kevin Durant. <laughs> right. So if they beat them, I don't think that it's going to do anything to diminish or, or to prove that last year was a fluke. The Cavs beat them fair and square, and quite frankly, plenty of people are going to still get 3-1 jokes up. Yeah, and, and plenty of people will still look for ways to discredit the Warriors and say, oh, well, you had all the talent. You had the stacked deck. This is what you were supposed to do. You know, like the old Chris Rock joke is like, am I supposed to give you credit for taking care of your kids? That's right? what I like. I like what Greg Popovich said last night, that yes, they have all this talent, but look at the way that they play. Look at the way that they share the ball. Look at the way that they defend. They, they may be the favorite, and they may have the overwhelming edge in terms of talent, but we've seen talented teams underachieved totally they, they play as they say the right way yeah and look since today apparently i'm in the business of giving credit i give credit to the warriors for being super aggressive beyond aggressive beyond just adding a few tweaks or deciding you know what we're just going to run this back to go out and get kevin durant because that's what you want if you're a fan of the warriors that's what you want them to do to always be in that mode of going for the jugular and making the league look at your team as the standard of the league and and that's what they did and by the way for an owner to say, oh, I don't care who we play. Yes, you do. You want Cleveland. And I hate to tell him this, but I don't care if they beat the Cavaliers by an average of 50 and sweep them. It's not going to make up for 3-1. Like, 3-1 is 3-1, and you just have to live with the fact that your team was in that position and they couldn't seal the deal. I'm glad Nothing you-, you do this season, even if they go undefeated, okay, the rest of the playoffs, that's not going to make up for what happened that last up because year. He, okay, so you look at the 12-0 and, and you say, okay, it was Portland. Uh, minus Yusuf Nurkic. It's the Jazz, who are good, but obviously not on that level. And the Spurs, they maybe they don't beat the Warriors at full strength, but they were beating them by 23 before Kawhi went down it, Maybe it's on a, the a road. longer series and a tougher series, but I don't think the outcome's different. I, my point in bringing that up, though, is I, I do think there's significance in this beyond him being the first team to beat 12-0 is that Maybe it's a precursor. Like, they're, they're legitimately this good. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm trying to get myself prepared for the fact that maybe this series isn't the classic, this rubber match finals. Maybe it's not the classic that we've built it up to be. Like, maybe they go and gentlemen sweep, if not sweep the Cavaliers. It wouldn't shock me, given how good this team is and the Cavaliers' flaws, which can be exposed here and there, it, even with LeBron. It wouldn't shock me if the Warriors ran rough shot over the Cavaliers. Which brings me to the larger conversation we've been having about how this team will be perceived, uh, even though we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit, how they'll be perceived and how Durant will be perceived, in particular if they win a championship, people tend to hate a little less hard in hindsight. As in, I just wonder if 10, 15, 20 years from now, or maybe, even, maybe we're still too close to it, if they do go 16-0 and 0 or 15-1 and 1 and win this championship, will they be recognized for the great team that they actually are, despite how they came together and who they beat or whatever, quote unquote, luck you want to assign to their path to get to this. I like to think more objective minds and cooler heads in some regards will prevail and that uh, some fans won't be so in their feelings about competitive balance, that they will truly regard this team uh, for how good they are. And for that matter, the the manner in which they play It's just in a in a culture, in a sports culture where we're constantly complaining about selfish players and me guys and all this to see a group of individuals this talent is so fit together so nicely I think we need to all appreciate that but that probably if they win the title my fear is that that probably won't okay. won't happen but Durant didn't take the harder route I'm just I'm just saying <laughs> Look, like, that's, dip- I, he I appreciate took a your difficult effort route, that's a Mike. creative take <laughs> all right he took a difficult I pre- route no well look at what we have here the no fun league is relaxing Roger Goodell announced via a letter to the fans from the spring meeting in Chicago that players can again use the football as a prop, celebrate as a group, and go to the ground, snow angels and stuff like that. He says he's listening to the fans and the players, 80 of which he says he consulted on this. Now, uh, Marvin Lewis, he might be in the minority on this move, saying in part, I'm not for that at all. 
That's not a very good example uh, for young people. He said he had a standard, and the whole standard has always been you want to teach people how to play the game the correct way and go about it the correct way, not feeling this. He is, of course, on the NFL's competition committee. Is this cause for celebration? Um... Mm, I won't say muted celebration because what kind of celebration is that? But I think, uh, well, real quick, just to address sure, Marvin shoot. Lewis, um, they did draft the Joe Mixon, right? <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to point that out because um, he's worried about the kids and everything. Was, and that's, so this is a little rich for you? No, I mean, I'm just saying, like, oh, now all of a sudden, what about the children? It's like, okay, all right. Uh, off the soapbox on that. I understand that people probably looked at it as a good sign because you have – uh, the league actually listening to the players, which that can that doesn't seem to happen as often as it should. But I don't know if it was really about the players or even if if it was more about the officials who, you know, supposedly made their opinions known that they were tired of being put in a bad position to have to judge celebrations. And, um, you know, therefore, obviously, sometimes costing People feel position. Some would even say costing games. You know, however, it was it was something always at risk there. So I understand that. I, I know a lot of people like Marvin Lewis still think that way. It's old school, right there. It's, it's super old school, and I'm just like, look, I would, I if it were up to me, we go back to the day was where Joe Horn uh, had the telephone and was you know making elaborate uh, celebrations and the popcorn and all that. We go back to that because I I like to believe that the majority of fans really enjoy seeing this. They enjoy seeing this natural exuberance. I mean, it, it just bothers me, for example, baseball, that there seems to be a suppression of fun at all times. That if you're having too much fun, then you're somehow disrespected in the game. And I think they can go hand in hand. So, Why you got to be so cynical? What, what do you mean? Or, or you just jaded when it comes to the NFL? I am, because like they, 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 they rarely right. seem to do things for the right reason. Well, but... Sometimes they just luck up. <laughs> also, here's another thing. Common sense ain't so common, and maybe they're just finally applying some measure of common sense like this isn't this may not be everything you want to be where it's just you know everybody gets to do what you want and no consideration for the example that it sets or anything like that you know but still it's better than the way it was I mean to be able to use the ball as a prop to be able to have group celebrations to be able to go to the ground you know how creative these cats are you know how much time and energy they put into some of these celebrations so it's at least progress and I do think that's worth celebrating it may not be like oh the NFL has gotten it right and it may not make up for all of the missteps that Roger Goodell and everybody else have had over the years but this I think is cause for applause cause for celebration as you said yeah Yeah. quiet applause look I'm happy that they're relaxing a little bit but right. it, it kind of reminded me when I was growing up I had a I had a strict mother and so whenever uh you know she would shut me down on nine or ten things and it could be something simple like can I just be on the porch for a little while I would be like oh my gosh she let me on the porch but it's kind of like all right well you still look it's, you're still not gonna be able to you know have the gyrations that they find to be offensive you're still not gonna be able to go very long with your celebration you're still not gonna be able to taunt people right all right so but, so, no so, so the, the people <laughs> the people out there that say oh you know we want some kind of respect. It's still there, Marvin Lewis's of the world. It's still there. They're not letting them go too far, but far enough to where it's not, okay, come on. Yeah. A lot of it, you roll your eyes at some of it. Not much, though. Call this the NFL's latest effort to further break things that already were broken. Uh, NFL See? owners voted today to change the overtime rules, reducing the extra period from 10, from 15, sorry, uh, to 10 minutes. The move supposedly was done in the interest of player safety. More minutes on the field, more potential for injury, blah, blah, blah. Oh, goody, now we'll have more ties. Where do you stand on NFL overtime? Well, didn't they point out that I think it was like 26% of OT games uh, the last couple of years had actually gone beyond 10 minutes? Mm-hmm. So if that's the case, then why even make the change if it doesn't happen that often? Exactly. They're basically using that number to say, hey, it's not a big deal. Well, why? Leave well enough alone. If it's about player safety. They don't play on Thursdays. But since that ain't happening, right? It's, it's senseless to me. Yeah, this is very senseless to me. Personally, I love to see it go back to sudden death overtime. Um, I wouldn't go that far. I, I definitely would I like go that both far. teams getting the possession. You know, I get that people say, okay, well, it seems like the team that wins is just the team that wins the coin toss. Again, your defense can stop the other player. And to me, but I, I just said it's the root of it, though. The I root of it was things. quarterbacks, not I got to stop you, and then I got to go score it. Anyway, a bit of bookkeeping news. So, Rob Gronkowski restructured his deal for this season. Uh, he got incentives. Gives him a chance to boost this year's salary from 5.25 to $10.75 million. This is interesting to me from this standpoint. Like, we talk about all the things the Patriots did this offseason, all people they added. In a sense, they're kind of adding Gronk back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they won yeah, it without me. Forget they won it without Gronk. Like, I, I, I ain't Gronk coming yeah, back. Like, right. whether he can stay healthy remains to be seen. But it's like, my goodness. 
embarrassment of riches, and he deserves the opportunity to be even richer. Yes, he does deserve that. And there was always some sort of speculation that Gronk wasn't very happy with his contract. So this is a way to kind of keep one of their best players happy and also, at least the way this deal appears to be set up, keep them in sort of a you-have-to-earn-it uh, type of Look status. at that. Look at that. <laughs> Mike Glennon. Proof that they made the right move. He could throw it through a tire. Yeah, because we Back know, in the day, he had Kyle you got to do that on one, one knee. Game. Yes. Uh, Mike Glennon, the poster boy for life comes at you fast, essentially said today he's unbothered by the presence of second overall pick, Mr. I Mitchell mean, Trubisky. Like everyone here, I was surprised. Um, you know, that's bottom line, but the, it was made clear to me about 10 minutes after from a call from Ryan and the next morning again, 2017 season is my year. So, uh, that's all I can worry about. I'm not worried about the future. I'm not worried about the past. I'm worried about the present. And right now, this is my team. And that's where my focus is. So you buying this positive attitude? This is my team. He even said that he would have still signed with the Bears had he known then that yeah, they would have Yeah, for $15 million, dollars, yeah. <laughs> they would have drafted Mitchell Trubisky. When it came out that he, you know, he felt blindsided and felt cheated on, I think, mm-hmm. was the was the analogy that they used when, he, when they picked him. I was like, dude, just handle your business. Don't worry about it. Now, if you own four, it may not be your team after that. But just handle your business. No, it was a questionable decision in most people's minds because we don't know if he could even play. Correct. So why should Mike Glennon be bothered by the presence of a second overall pick? Yeah, there's politics involved, but let's see if he could actually produce. Well, I I did understand why he was bothered by it, uh, especially, you know, given the circumstances. But I I do buy this positive attitude because I'm sure now he's had some time to kind of cool down and assess the situation. Mitchell Trubisky only has to see the field if you let him. Exactly. Right? That's pretty much the end of it. All right, so the Steelers drafted Josh Dobbs later in the draft because they got to start planning for a future without Ben Roethlisberger, who's all in for the present. He's 110% committed for 2017, but he has not provided the organization or publicly committed to 2018. So he out here Brett Favre, basically. Yeah, yeah, I might retire, I might not. I'm thinking about it, maybe not. I guess, I don't know, does the, the adage apply to him that if you're thinking about retirement, then in your mind, on some level, you've already retired or you already see when the end is coming. I just thought the comments were curious. Unnecessary drama. Like what was wrong with saying, hey, I'm here now, happy to be a Steeler, move on. But it seems like he left this door open, like, oh, will he or won't he? I think he's at that age where that's reality, though. Like, I don't, I don't think he's necessarily courting the attention over it. I think if somebody asked him about 2018, he doesn't know. I think he knows he's in this year with a really good team around him, which is part of the incentive for him to come back and keep getting beat up. So it's like, enjoy Ben while you can, Steelers fans, because he may be gone pretty soon. Yeah, I agree with you there. Players are thinking about retiring probably earlier and earlier. Okay, now some sad NFL news. Hall of Fame defensive lineman Cortez Kennedy died at age 48, according to the Orlando police department. While authorities confirmed to ESPN they are investigating Kennedy's death, police say there's nothing suspicious to report at this time. Kennedy spent all 11 seasons of his career with Seattle, where he made eight Pro Bowls and won the Defensive Player of the Year in 1992. He was named to the Seahawks Ring of Honor, and his number 96 jersey was retired by the team. Of course, there was an outpouring of condolences and sympathy around the NFL and retirement. Kennedy not only remained a significant part of the Seahawks organization, but he also was an informal consultant with the Saints. He was extremely close to general manager Mickey Loomis. Kennedy was the godfather of one of Loomis's daughter and one of Loomis's sons, whose middle name was Cortez. We'll see if the Celtics can continue to make this an interesting series. And with that, Michael Leaves, our boy, looking dapper as always, joins us right here on The Six. Uh, Mike, we know that Amir Johnson was a game time decision. What is the latest on his status? Yeah, Jamel, he's not going to play. A couple sources have told me that that right uh, AC joint that he sprained is bothering him too much. He's not going to be able to go. He was at shoot-around this morning and was on the court, but when he left the court and went back to the team hotel, he had an ice pack on that shoulder, and he also received pain treatment today. So he's not going to be able to go. Not sure if he'll be able to go game five when he gets back to Boston, but he will not play tonight. And that leaves Brad Stevens with a couple of choices with his starting lineup. Now, if you go back to game two, we remember that he didn't start Amir Johnson. He brought him off the bench, and instead he started Gerald Green. But here's the thing. Amir Johnson, he doesn't play a lot of minutes, maybe 10, 12 minutes a game. But while he's out there, he does a couple things. One, he gives you size while he's on the court, which helps from a defensive standpoint and maybe keeping guys out of the lane. But he also helps with the rotations of guys who come in off the bench, saving the minutes here or there to keep them fresh. So with that being said, there's a chance that Kelly Olenek could actually start tonight in place of Amir Johnson. Now, that would be somewhat surprised because he hasn't started a game all postseason, and he's very effective when he comes off the bench. But again, with no Amir Johnson not just being able to play tonight, 
Uh, Brad Stevens will have to do something. There's a chance that Kelly Olenek could get the start tonight. But, again, it's going to have to be a team effort as it was in Game 3. And, you know, Avery Bradley said earlier, they've got to do something to make it difficult for everybody on this squad to go off. But, you know, I have a theory, Mike and Jamel, that it may not even matter. It may not matter <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> who plays or who starts tonight. Give us this and and I'll tell you why. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you why. If you think about it, LeBron James is basically the Debo of the NBA. Right? He just cruises around the league on his beach cruiser, <laughs> stealing shots and <laughs> crushing hopes and dreams. Right? Snatch and change. Well, in game three, in game three, the Celtics treated LeBron like Craig treated Debo, and then Red came in, Ezel took his shoes. <laughs> Remember in next Friday how mad Debo was to get back at Craig? He rode in the back a dog cage from South Central to Rancho Cucamonga. Now, folks who live in L.A. know that nobody's willing to make that drive unless you're getting paid or you're really mad. Debo was really mad. And think about it. We haven't seen Smokey, Ezel, or Red since Debo got knocked out. So the Celtics might be in trouble. All right, next I'm time, just saying, Debo's mad. Next he's down there and he's mad. Say spoiler alert, okay, Mike? <laughs> In case for those who haven't seen it. Uh, thank you so much. What for you did there, us. we see it. Yeah, thank we you, man. see it, man. <laughs> All great. right. Uh, so, LeBron, he's had his fair share of moments against the Celtics, game three notwithstanding, who, of course, t- game six, 2011, mm-hmm. in the Garden. But with tonight about to be his 79th career game against the Celtics, Chad Finn of the Boston Globe has an interesting column. He points out the fact that Magic Johnson only faced the Celtics a total of 39 times in his career. Obviously, three times in the finals. Lakers taking two out of three. So he writes that LeBron James is a bigger Celtics rival than Magic Johnson ever was. You willing to go there? I can see why he... I can see how he arrived at this conclusion. And some of this does depend on how you define rivalry. Like, you and I debate that uh, all the time. LeBron and the Celtics now... It isn't much of a rivalry. It's very one-sided. And maybe he's looking at it from the perspective of not only how many times they face each other and, and, and play, but what happened as a result of LeBron's dominance in the Eastern Conference. The Celtics essentially broke up. Uh, they had to retool and rebuild, and now they Well, find- LeBron went there because of the Celtics. Exactly. He went to Miami he because He went to Miami. He, he made the first chess move yeah. by going to Miami because he got tired of running against him. Right. And so then by being in Miami, being dominant there, he, was, he made the Celtics sort of dismantle. Uh, he and they're sped- still bitter about that. Exactly. He, still, he sped that process up. And, oh, by the way, he took their boy, Ray Allen, who they're still mad at, and won a ring with him, which has to... You know, obviously, a lot of the former Celtics are still salty about that. And now the Celtics have pretty much set up their entire future with the idea of we will be a great team, hopefully by the time LeBron James is out of his prime or is no longer as big of a factor as he is right now in the Eastern Conference. So I understand how how he said that. Now, entertainment wise, it's not the same. Well, look, if you want to say, with all due respect to the great Magic Johnson, that LeBron is the best there's a lot of people think he's the second best player, not the greatest player of all time. Mm-hmm. So you want to say he's the best player he's ever, they've ever faced, that's fine. He averages more points against the Celtics than anybody else, any other individual team in his career. I think 29.3 or something like that, right? But to say he's a bigger nemesis for Boston than Magic, I don't, I don't see that. Be- only because you're talking about LeBron has had no equal, even though Paul Pierce at one point was his, the closest he thing he had has, to a rival. he has even said that. Right, but he has no equal in terms of caliber, caliber of player. Magic and Bird were trading best player in the world title at the time. There's a movie, The Courtship of Rivals, a documentary, right. HBO documentary we made about that rivalry. For 30s or anything about there was a LeBron cultural versus... component to Lakers-Celtics in the 80s that the league was resurrected upon. So Magic Bird meant more than just who was better or who scored more against the Celtics than anybody else or who played the Celtics more often. Yes, LeBron has had his moments, but in terms of Celtic historic rivals, hell, I'd even put, I'd even put Will, even though Bill Russell owned them in terms of championships, I put Will versus Russell and then Magic and Bird ahead of uh, LeBron versus the Celtics. As good as LeBron has been, as much as he's tormented them, I get all of that. But historically speaking, it feels like Magic and Bird met more, along with Russell. No, and, and that's Samuel. fair, and I agree with that. I, I think 
it, the purpose of the piece was to look at this more just from a pure maybe basketball sense, less emotionally. He's less, the best player they face. If you want to yeah. say that, that's fine. And, and again, that's why I said it depends on how you define rivalry. Yeah. Rivalry, it's got to be a level of equality. You have to be taking things from each other. And obviously that's not the case now with LeBron and the Celtics. All right, as a show of respect, Pop began what would be the final game of the Spurs season with Mano Ginobili in the starting lineup. It may have been the end for Ginobili and the end of an era for San Antonio as Ginobili turns 40 this summer. Qué sé yo, de emoción, así que sí, fue 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 raro, eh, pero lindo, lindo de vivir. Manu, uh, you didn't just retire in Spanish, did you, Manu? No. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. So 15 and 7 in his last game, I know he turns 40. I, I hope he comes back. Look, if he walks away, he's got nothing left to accomplish. Got the four championships, got the gold medal, international player, great NBA player. Uh, in terms of his box plus minus, right up there with some of the greatest shooting guards mm-hmm. of all time. So surefire Hall of Famer, right? But I'd like to see him come back because there's a Clipper, there's a Clipperishness to the way yeah, this season. Yeah, you have to explain that because the, the Clip, Clippers and Spurs don't necessarily well, you know, the same you know how I keep, Well, you know how I keep saying that the Clippers, there's something to be said for them staying together mm-hmm. given how much bad luck they've experienced in the playoffs. Some people don't think they could ever get it done as personally constituted. But if you're the Clippers, you're like, man, what if, right? If you're the Spurs, and again, you were beating them by 23 on the road with Kawhi Leonard, maybe you wouldn't have beaten the Warriors. But you got to look at this and say, if we could re-sign Patty Mills and bring this squad back, maybe we can beat them as presently constituted. Now, look, if you can get Chris Paul to take less to come there, if you could flip LaMarcus Aldridge maybe, and I don't know, Paul Millsaps, might be available. There might be some upgrades available to you, but as presently constituted, if Manu were to come back, I think they can look at themselves and say, hey, we can give that team a run if not for Zaza Pachulia's closeout. Well, usually a, a lot of ifs um, are built around, you know, sort of wanting to win a championship. And this is to say Manu does not want to, but he's accomplished so much already. And I don't want to pretend or act as if he's still not thirsty. I mean, of course he is. You could tell by the way uh, that he played in this series, despite the fact that he was undermanned, how much uh, it meant to him and how much he wanted to carry them in this moment. But just looking in his eyes last night as the crowd was serenading him and, and, and in a standing ovation and obviously appreciating everything he's done, he, it just kind of felt like it was over. And maybe I'm maybe because it's in the moment, it's easy to come to that conclusion. Uh, yeah. and, and I believe him when he says I'm going to truly take some time to, to, to think about misses, it. Yeah. But it just didn't feel that what way. What do people say more like about him than anybody? He's one of the greatest competitors of all time. Absolutely. So that just doesn't go away just because people decided to serenade you because it was it might be the last time. I think you go back and say, I can still play this game. And if this team still wants me, I can still be an important factor on a championship team. People thought he should have retired the year that they lost to Miami when you know? he looked finished. And look how he came back from that. So right. just when you think he's done and got nothing left, he's still nutmegging and euro-stepping people. And, uh, well, I, I missed some of the high-level uh, flops. Maybe you can kill a bet. Time or a little doing too much countdown. This would have been my favorite one if not for knowing what's coming at number two. So last year, members of the Ravens uh, got together at Dennis Pitta's house to watch The Bachelorette, and they continued the tradition last night. Justin Tucker proceeded to throw shade at Pitta's TV situation. No sound bar. Apparently, it was a little too small for his liking. You know about that TV life, or used to know about it when, when you had the computer monitor. Yeah. But this is about the TVs. I mean, it sort of is. This is about The Bachelorette. Did you watch it last night? No. I need you to get on this. No. First of all, no, I don't do the bachelor. Do Mr. Bachelor. Wham Boom needs to go away. I'm, I'm already in love with one of them, Brian. So he was the only one that goes in and went in for the, the multiple kisses. He's two kisses up on everybody. He's got a 2-0 lead. I know you're interested in this. Go ahead, talk about TVs. Is that, is that what you want to talk about? I'm just waiting for you to get your pop. Get my, ba- my bachelor takes, takes off. off. Yeah, exactly. Um, so just wait for it and continue to wait for it. Okay. Continue to wait for it. <laughs> but you're not waiting for it. You're seeing it fully unfold. This is taking this is, is this deaf? Like, I don't know what this is. I mean, I know what this is, but are you impressed or are you just like, sit down somewhere? <laughs> they better not ever fall out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They hey. Thunder buddies and best friends for life. You know that much. Let me act like somebody's mama. I hope they know their homework as well as they knew who <laughs> those. Uh, so two memes. Uh, that became the meme of the night, or the memes of the night last night. You saw David West there with the stare down, and then Victor Arvizidis and little children of the corn <laughs> with the, <red, laughs> the blood stain red art on his forehead. 
That's crazy. Which that, one do you that, like better? It's got to be the, the bloody R. Because how does that happen? I don't know. I, I, and uh, you know, you don't. You want to kind of leave it there. You don't want to wash yeah, that off. But, but in a way, you it's do like, because it's kind of spooky and scary at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Speaking of spooky, college recruit Unique Brissett, which is now going to be my alias at hotels. Not that I need it because Michael Smith serves the same purpose. Uh, he's not real. He was able to convince some fans, I mean, you know, the recruiting part's not real, and media that he was being recruited by your Michigan State, among other schools, out of Globe Institute of Technology in New York, a high school that was closed last September. Like, that, that high school didn't even sound He's deleted that. his social media accounts. He got busted for using pictures of somebody else used. use. So what is this, like catfishing for recruiting? More or less. Uh, as what is as the infamous? No, you see, unique reset the second. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Just to get that clear, there's another one. Um, as the old adage, you were getting excited, weren't you? You thought you don't you'd... have to lie to kick it. I had, honestly, I hadn't even heard about this kid. Yeah. I have to say, you know, how I feel about recruiting in general, but why go through such lens for what? Fake news out there, man. To get us, he, he had us fooled for a second. Yeah, apparently, you can make your own recruiting profiles and see what you want. All right, uh, we wanted number two. Dutch cyclist. <laughs> to be number two for obvious reasons. Uh, Dutch cyclist Tom Dumoulin. Um, well, let's just say he explained why he all of a sudden pulled over on the side of the road. Uh, I just had uh, <coughs> problems. I needed to uh, to take a, a dump. And uh, yeah, I could not hold it anymore. At least he's on there. <laughs> Sometimes you just... But he took a shirt off. Nature calls. And you couldn't have just held it? Or? I've been holding it the whole show. <laughs> I've been having a go since we started, to be honest with you. But see, I'm always full of it. So, I mean, okay. one of these days I'm just going to... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm here for it. I, it's just not that much of an emergency. I would find a way. I'd clinch everything Clearly I had. Clearly, you never to. had to go that bad. No, i clinch everything I had. To Sometimes not... clinching is just... Mm. No. Let's go hard in the paint. Fred, of course, as I predicted. Of course. <laughs> advanced to their first uh, Stanley Cup last night, beat the Ducks 6-3. It was on in Nashville. Titans once again at the game. Taylor Lewan tossed a catfish on the ice. Did not cut his finger on said catfish. <laughs> We cut it on a beer can instead, just in case you were curious. Uh, P.K. Subban tweeted a photo kissing Ryan Johansson, who's injured on the cheek. It was just great awesome, story. awesome scene. Really great around. story for P.K. Subban. I'm sure the Habs fans are still pretty salty uh, considering. He called it. He did. He said they had the team to make it to the Stanley Cup Finals. He was right. Speaking of getting to the Cup, Penguins, uh, they may repeat and go to the Cup as well, depending on what happens tonight with the Senators. Um, do you think the Pens close it out? Since I'm on a roll? Yeah, since you're on a roll, Mr. Hockey, go ahead. Yeah, they, they close seven. it out. They close it out. Yeah, I think so, too. I think it'd be a... Pen's prayers. Let's do this. Pen's prayers. Be a great... You like the alliteration, don't you? Is that what it is? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm messing with you, but... Instead I think of my analysis. Upstart versus Crosby, I think it'd be great. Uh, Odell Beckham. Supposed to be uh, at OTAs later this week, and he'll be a richer man. Mm. Supposedly just signed the most lucrative endorsement deal for an NFL player. His new mm-hmm. Nike deal can reach up to eight years and 48 million dollars. Wow. Uh, I guess that's a good reason to miss OTAs, but it doesn't surprise me um, or at least miss a couple days of them. It doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, he's a magnetic player, yeah. a lot of charisma. Um, so, no, I'm not surprised at all that this uh, that you would give this guy a lot well of money deserved. to sell your Absolutely. product. Very well deserved. All right. Uh, before we call it a day, let's say you had a good day starting with Tavis Bryant. First day back at practice from suspension. How difficult has that been to do to change it all around? In the first three weeks was hard, but it's been a whole year now since I smoked. So, you know, maintaining it in that is net as long as I continue to have my right people around me, pass my tests, go to my counseling, and do the things that I need to do, I will be fine. So he knows he doesn't have many chances left. Here's hoping he makes the most of this one. 15 touchdowns over his first 21 games. Loaded receiver group mm-hmm. for the Steelers. They just drafted Juju Smith Schuster in the second round, so somebody's going to be the odd man out. Or Tavis Bryant, a lot of talent. Make the most of it, man. Yeah, good to see him taking advantage seemingly of this opportunity. It was also a good day for Texas offensive tackle David Questenberry. Returned to the practice field today for the first time since he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin T lymphoblastic lymphoma three years ago. So I'm sure he's very happy to be back on the field. What a great story. Absolutely. All right, that does it for us. Not sure if uh, this game is going off or not. It was delayed, right? Yeah. All right, (laughs) so we got Cubs, Giants next right here on ESPN. SportsCenter, of course, continues on ESPN2. That is it for the six. I've held it long enough. Uh, I know you know, y'all. You should clarify which one. 
No, don't want to clarify which one you It's number three. <laughs> I mean, that's both of them. One and two. I'm out. I'll you see y'all later. You're nasty. You're nasty. Yeah. Mike.